Good evening and happy Sabbath. Thank you for the song that has been given to us by the young voices. Indeed, it is a pleasant evening tonight because it's not raining. And I am so glad to see all of us tonight, although not as many as we are when we are in an ordinary school day. But nevertheless, we are here tonight to study the Word together, and we are going to participate in the communion service. Tonight, our topic is about Calvary, the ultimate sacrifice. Indeed, our identity in Christ is focused on Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us. And so we want to pray for the Holy Spirit tonight as we start our study. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for bringing us together once again to study your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to dwell upon us, to open our hearts, to open our minds, and give us an understanding that we need. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you are judged, where you committed a mistake and you are supposed to pay a penalty and it is going to cost you dearly. I was driving in Manila one day and as we were approaching a rotunda, I was not aware that I was in the outer lane and I was going to go around which I should be in the inner lane. As soon as I went around from the outer lane, I immediately switched to the inner lane. I was flagged down by a police and a traffic enforcer. And they pulled me to the side and he said, Good, evening, good afternoon, sir. Mukang may violation tayo. I said, what is it? Swerving. Oh, how was I swerving? Ah, kasi nasa outer lane po kayo, eh, inner lane. I didn't understand what he was saying. But so I went down, I gave him my driver's license, and he called me to the side. So he explained. And I said, we will issue a ticket. Because he was talking in Tagalog and I said, I am, I don't understand Tagalog. I'm a foreigner. So when he saw in my driver's license, it states there, Indonesian. So he started speaking in, in English. I said, sir, you know, violation like this, you need to go and pay fine in court. Oh, really? I don't have time. I'm a student. Oh, okay. You also need to attend seminar seven days. What for? To learn how to drive properly. Huh? So I asked him, so what do I do? Well, you have to pay penalty, sir. I was thinking, seven days, I have to go to, the, to Pasig in the LTO office and attend seminar. Why? I said, I cannot do it. So I was thinking of the many days that I have to miss my classes in order for me to get my license back. Well, to make the long story short, I finally had to give in and pay the penalty right there, which was, of course, more expensive than if you would have paid it in court. But the fact is, they gave me back my license and I was cleared from the burden of being caught in a traffic violation. You know, sometimes when we 
attempt to do something, we think we can get out of it easily. We think when we make mistakes that nobody is, least, is looking, we can just be, get off easily. But sometimes we think that we didn't know that we made a mistake. In my story just now, I didn't know that I had to be in the to switch lane. I was not allowed to lanes. And so I was about to suffer the consequences of that violation. So finally, I had to pay the penalty. I had to pay the price. But in my story, I was talking about a traffic violation. Statement: I have paid the price. I have paid the price. When God says, I have paid the price, God is talking about the ultimate price. God was talking about the ultimate price that He paid in Calvary to set everyone free. And so, yes, Calvary is the answer to the charge of Satan. You know what was Satan's charge against God? He said, God, you are not fair. You are not a fair God. You create all the suffering for men. Therefore, you are not a fair and just God. Calvary is the answer to what gives pardon from the penalty of death. Calvary is the one that sets us free. But why Calvary? Why does Calvary play an important price in the ultimate price? Calvary is the ultimate price simply because of the man of God. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. And God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And in our key text, we see that oops, we see that 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, "For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus is the God-man, the only God-man to save mankind. Only the Creator Himself is qualified to save His creation. And that is why we find in the book of, in the Gospel of John, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. John 1:14. Out of all the heavenly beings, there was nobody else who fit the qualification to pay the penalty of death. No angel can do that. No other created being could. He had to be the God-man called Jesus Christ. Because He is the only one who personally knew the height and depth of God's love and is the only one who could accomplish our redemption. It was told of a story during the First World War. There was a young French soldier who was seriously wounded. His arm was so badly smashed that they had to cut his arm off. And so while he was still recuperating, the doctor looked at this man. Such a young life to sacrifice himself in this war. So he, stood, he sat by the bedside of the man waiting for him to wake up. As soon as this young soldier woke up, the doctor said, I'm sorry to tell you that you have lost your arm. And you know what the soldier said? Sir, I did not lose it. I gave it for France. 
You see the point? Jesus did not lose his life, but instead he gave it. When Jesus was taken from Pilate's court to Herod's palace, and back again, Jesus was not helplessly caught in a mesh of circumstances which he could not break free. We are told that he could have called upon thousands of angels to set him free, to intervene, to help him be out of this circumstance, but he did not do it. He did not lose his life. He gave his life. The cross was not forced him he willingly accepted it for you and me and guess what this is what we call the ultimate price because he did it for free you see there are some things that money can buy money can buy and cannot buy money can buy a bed but not sleep Money can buy a hammer, but not a carpenter. It can buy things, but not friends. It can buy a toy, but not a child's happiness. It can buy a pen and paper, but not an author. It can buy a pencil, but not an idea. It can buy a house, but not a home. It can buy a wedding, but not peace. It can buy paints, but not an artist. It can buy eyeglasses, but not eyesight. It can buy a chair, but not rest. It can buy a computer, but not wisdom. It can buy a flag, but not patriotism. It can buy a gun, but not a soldier. It can buy a book, but not knowledge. It can buy a machine, but not a skill. It can buy a name, but not a man. It can buy a church, but not a religion. And it can buy an altar, but not salvation. And most of all, money can buy a cross, but not a savior. There are many things in this list that money cannot buy. Money cannot buy love, there is no price tag on love. Do you think there is a price tag on love? No, there is no price tag on love. You know, when I first fell in love with my wife now, I spent, in my estimate, I spent a lot of money. But I didn't care. You know why? Because my wife was, was studying in MCU in Manila. And then I was in Ayas. So in order me to visit her, oh, I had to save money so I can go to her, go on a date in Manila. And then when it was Valentine's Day, I cannot go and give her flowers. I had to call a flower shop in Manila and then ask my friend, please ask them to deliver. I will pay you later. Oh, imagine, back in that time, one dozen flowers cost around 600 pesos in 1995, 96. That was a lot of money. But you see the point here. There is no price tag for love. There is no price tag for love. There is no price tag on one's life who has given it freely in order for others to not feel the consequences of what they are supposed to experience. There was once a scientist. They were experimenting on uh, certain radioactive chemicals. And he was supposed, he was supposed to pull this, push this screw with a screwdriver in order to stop the reaction of those radioactive materials. And so in the rehearsals, he was able to push it right in time before the reaction started. And so when the experiment was supposed to be put in public in front of reporters, he was contained in a room with his fellow scientists and the countdown started. 
And at the appropriate time, he was supposed to push the screw with the screwdriver. And you know what happened? The screwdriver slipped from his hand. And without thinking of anything of about himself or anything, he used his arms to move those two radioactive chemicals so that not everybody in, this, in the room will suffer the consequences of being contaminated. You see, that's the ultimate price that he paid in order for his friends not to suffer the consequence of being of being radioactively affected. That man died nine days later. And so tonight we want to see the picture of Jesus on Calvary. Why do we need to see this properly? Because many times we see Jesus, we picture Jesus without the nail-printed scars in His hands, we prefer a Jesus who looks like a big brother. We prefer Jesus as somebody who is like we are in love with. Because many of our songs portray Jesus who is very dear to us. Who is very, if we can describe it in words, sometimes Jesus is just like somebody who is just there, just like a lover. But tonight, I want us to picture Jesus differently. We want to picture Jesus as someone, as the Savior who has died on the cross. The more that we study and in the light of the cross, the more that we will see of His mercy, tenderness, forgiveness, which is blended with equity and justice. The more we walk and talk with the figure of Jesus, who has fresh nail prints in His hands, the more we will see Jesus in our minds as the one who died in our place. The more we would have the assurance that we are justified through the merit of His sacrifice. And so it is the Jesus of Calvary, not the Jesus of the womb or the Jesus of the tomb, but the Jesus of Calvary who gives the sinner another chance. You see what I mean here? If Jesus would just have died and he was put in the grave and he never resurrected, it is useless. And if Jesus never actually died, the more useless it is because he did not give his life for us. And so my young friends, if at any time you begin to fear that you will be lost, that Jesus does not love you, look to Him at Calvary, because He says, I am He that liveth, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation 1.18 Furthermore, He says, when you are witnessing of Him, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28.20 So Calvary is special because of the man of Calvary, Jesus Christ. But the cross of Calvary is the ultimate price because Jesus was there. The cross is the only ladder high enough to touch heaven's threshold. The cross is the only key to set a man free. Once there was a police officer named John Bolton, while escorting a prisoner from his cell to an arraignment proceeding, he noticed that this prisoner had a cross necklace hanging around his neck. And because he knows that this man is not a religious man, he double-checked. He asked, are you a Christian? And the prison said, no while hiding the cross. Then why do you have that cross? Oh, this is just a good luck charm. So someday, I might be out of this misery. But Constable Bolton was suspicious of this man. So he removed that cross necklace from the man. And he tried it on a handcuff. 
And apparently, it was like a master key for the handcuff. He tried it with several handcuffs and the handcuff opened. And at that time, they were able to uncover a secret undercover, underground attempt of prisoners in Ontario. Well, there have been attempts to make crosses that can set people free, there is only one cross that can ultimately set humans free. And this cross frees humans from the bondage of condemnation and of the law. And that cross is the cross of Calvary. Unfortunately, friends, many are more concerned about the freedom from the body than they are from the freedom for the soul. Whether inside or outside prison, all men need the cross that sets us free. And so we need to look high on the cross. We need to put the cross back where it belongs. I don't mean that we need to get a necklace with a cross on it and put it on our necks. No, this is not the cross that we are talking about. Nor is it a cross that is consigned to the or even confined to the church building. This is not the cross that we are talking about. We need to raise the cross where Jesus died. In. This cross needs to be raised again at the center of marketplace, as well as on the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles but a cross between two thieves on a town garbage heap. At the crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. And this place where Jesus was crucified was the place where people talked about bad things. Thieves curse. Gambling was rampant. That is where we need to raise the cross of Jesus. Not just among us, in our academic life but it should be raised among our neighborhood and wherever that we see a need where communities have degraded themselves in many communities actually it is not fashionable to say that i am a christian in fact the cross is a symbol of shame and disgrace two thousand years ago although it was for many different reasons. However, the same way, Jesus turned the symbol from shame and disgrace to amazing grace, His sacrifice. The hallmark of Jesus living in a self-denial is sacrifice. So let's put people first in our classes, in our neighborhood, if we are staying in apartments, in apartments, if we are staying with our families, in our families. If we are staying with some faculty, in our faculty and staff. And let us put Jesus first, more importantly, in our lives. People need to see that the cross of Christ makes the difference in our lives. They need to see that the, Jesus, the cross had produced in us a new code of behavior. The things that we used to do, we don't do them anymore. The things that we used to wear, we used to read, we used to watch, we don't do that anymore. The places where we used to go, the things that we used to do, we don't do it anymore. Because of the cross. Calvary is special and it has made a difference in our hearts. For this past week, we have studied many things that will help us identify ourselves in Christ, that we are Christ followers. And if we culminate it tonight with the cross, it will really complete our experience as Christians, as people who have been saved from sin. My dear friends, we notice this picture. This is the picture of Rembrandt. And if we look closely, if we are able to see this closely, we will see that Jesus is in the center and we see the other two thieves there. 
Some critics say that we can actually see the expression of the people. The expression of the people, they were sad, they were weeping. And the agony of the two thieves in pain. And the people, uh, the people were watching. They were perhaps whispering to each other, Look, look, they are suffering. Remember at that time, if you suffered the punishment of being crucified, that was the worst punishment that somebody can ever get. A criminal who faces sacrifice, uh, crucifixion is the worst, lowest punishment in the justice system of the Roman world. But Christ was willing to suffer for us. And if we notice in the three crosses, the crosses that was there in Calvary, there are three of them. The first one, the cross with a thief dying in sin. The second cross was a thief dying to sin. And the third one was the Redeemer dying for sin. You see, there are two kinds of sinners up there on the cross. The one dying in sin and the dying to sin. What kind of sinner are we? Are we sinners dying in sin or are we sinners dying to sin? The Redeemer died for us, died for sin. And so Calvary divides all humanity into these two categories. Those who reject Christ and die in sin, and those who want to die to sin by receiving Christ. If you are the one dying in sin, Jesus says, you have to pick up your cross daily. You have to pick up your cross daily. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, verse 24. So my dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of the decision that was made by the thief on the cross, who accepted the grace of Jesus at the time when he was about to die, Although it was a last-minute decision, it was still accepted by heaven. There was no fanfare. There was no long call for a decision. There was no Bible study. There was not even time for baptism. Although we have to realize that this also is important for us. But the point that I'm trying to make that the decision that was made by the sinner who wanted to die and receive Christ is important. Why? Because when God, when Christ responded to him, it was just a simple word. Remember me was replied by Christ. Today you will be with me. So my dear friends, by finding our identity with Christ, we should also associate ourselves with the importance of the ultimate sacrifice that God has made for us. And this ultimate sacrifice is something that no other human beings ever think about of doing for others. We may see in many illustrations, in many stories, that once in a while, there will be people that will become heroes because they live, they sacrifice their lives for the benefit of others. But none of these heroes have ever had the power like what Jesus' sacrifice did for mankind. These heroes may have saved five people, ten, a hundred, but they can never do, it can never achieve what Jesus did when he sacrificed his life on the cross. And so this evening, we have the opportunity to say in our heart, remember me. Remember me, Jesus.
And in so saying, we are actually saying, I accept the gift of Calvary, the ultimate price that heaven had to pay to redeem a poor sinner like me. I now want the miracle of Calvary to be performed in my daily life, to be performed in the way that I live, in the way that I dress myself, in the way that I project myself in my outward appearance, in the way that I live myself as a student, in the way that I interact with my classmates, in the way that I show respect and obedience to our teachers. Remember me, Jesus. Remember me. Calvary will empower us to have a change in our lives. And finally, we can identify ourselves with Jesus. We'll find our identity in Christ. And so this evening, my dear brothers and sisters, we are going to participate in the communion service. We are going to participate in the communion service that Christ has set an example for us to follow. Before that, we're going to have the foot washing ceremony. In the foot washing ceremony, we are encouraged to reflect on Jesus' humility, on Jesus' humble service to His disciples. And after doing so, after we serve one another in humility, following Christ's example, we are going to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the ultimate gift that He has given us. For some of us, maybe this will be our first time. We remember that when we partake in this, we have to really understand that Christ has died for us. And that we really need to accept this sacrifice that God has made so that it will be a meaningful experience when we partake of the bread and wine of the sacrifice that God indeed has made for us by Jesus dying on the cross. And so as I end our study tonight, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge the students. I want to challenge the teachers that in our daily life, let us always think about Jesus. Think about Jesus who has died on the cross for us and has made salvation possible for each one of us. And by doing so, it will create a change in our character, a change in our attitude so that we can be better human beings because we realize, we realize the enormity of that sacrifice which became an ultimate gift for us. Some of our friends have already stood up in our call for baptism. Tomorrow they will be baptized. Some of our friends are still concerned of what to do when they make this choice. And so I want you to stand up. I want, to stand up, I want you to stand up and come forward. Those of you who have made that decision, those of you who have signed the baptismal contract, I want you to stand and come forward because we want to pray for you tonight. We want to pray for you that you have made this choice and you will be strengthened. And you will be strengthened. I want you to stand up and come forward as we pray for you once again. Maybe some of you that has not made the decision yet, you want to make the decision now, realizing the importance of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Please come forward. Please come forward. Please don't be shy. Don't be shy. Please come forward. Yes. Please come forward. Thank you. Thank you. 
Shall we rise and we will pray together? Let us bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Because of that sacrifice, we do not need to die. We have received salvation. And this makes us children of God. Tonight, some of our friends have made a decision to accept Jesus as their personal Savior because they realize that the Jesus sacrifice is all sufficient to remove them from the bondage of sin and to accept them into the kingdom of heaven. As they have made this decision, dear Father, please guide them. They will be just like new babies born. Newborn babies born in this world. Their spiritual life is starting again. Help them to grow in grace every day. And help us, our friends, to guide these young friends. As teachers, to guide them so that they may grow continually in Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to study the whole week about how we can identify ourselves in Jesus Christ through the ultimate sacrifice on the cross we realize that indeed we are Christians we are children of God that you have saved for your kingdom thank you for your love for us Thank you that you will listen to our prayers and answer them according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you. You may go back to your seats.